Good morning. As Brother Nathan said, it is a great blessing to be here, to be gathered together. And uh, I do hope and pray that as Brother Justin uh, asked God today that my thoughts uh, come to me easily. Uh, that is something that we want to do is express the Word of God in a way that is uh, full of integrity and truth. And uh, I appreciate the prayer on my behalf. I wanted to start today by just recalling some of the reading. And as we looked at this question that was asked of Jesus by one of the scribes, it, it's somewhat of a peculiar question when you think about how many commandments were given to Israel. And he said, what's the greatest? What's the first of all the commandment? What is the commandment that supersedes all others? And Jesus starts by saying, hear, O Israel. And that's interesting to me. Listen, he says, listen, Israel. The Lord our God is one. The Lord our God is one. And John talked to us last week about who God is. God is not like a man. He's not like us. God is holy. And, and sometimes that word holy just escapes us. We don't really think about what that means. It means separate. It means God is not like anything else. He is completely and totally separate from the world, from, from everything that is corporeal and physical. God is not like us. He is holy and He is separate. And He says, that God is the God that you should love. And He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. This is the greatest of all. So there's four distinct things that Jesus mentions here. And I think sometimes we read this and we think to ourselves, well, he just means love God with all of yourself. And I think that's absolutely true. He, he means love God with all of your being, all of yourself. But, but you ever thought about why he mentions four distinct things? So that's, Lord willing, going to be the series that we're going to be uh, Going through in the next few days, or the next few weeks rather, uh, next week Brother Nathan is Lord willing going to talk to us about loving God with all of our strength and then Brother Monty is going to talk to us about loving God with all of your mind. Uh, that word soul there means the life and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But, but when we think about love, I want to think about love for just a moment. Now there's a lot of ideas about what love is and, and if we're going to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength, we've got to ask God, what is love? What is love, God? And you know, Jesus defines what love is in the Gospels. As he talked to his disciples, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so maybe you've heard something like this. Love's not a thing. Love is a verb. It's something that we do. It's an action that is manifest in our life. But you know what? That's very true. And obviously Jesus is teaching that. And other passages teach us that as well. But, but you ever seen and noticed that we take that concept and we swing so far one way that we say love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Now here's what we do. We, we take the baby and we throw it out with the bath water. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. No, love is not just a feeling. Love is an action also. And you say, well, uh, you know, people get confused about feelings and we don't know which feelings are love and which ones aren't love. And I don't want to get into all that this morning. I just want you to know that as Jesus taught us to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, the word heart there literally means the affections or the feelings of a man. And so what does Jesus start with? Love God with your feelings. Love Him with your feelings. But also love God with your life. And also love God with your thoughts or your understanding as the scribe that was conversing with Jesus understood what Jesus said to be the understanding. And then love God with all of your strength. And if you think about all those things, they encompass our entire life. My desires and my priorities, my affections, but also how I think and what I think and the, and the fundamental truths that I believe and also what I do with the energy and the breath that God has given to me, my strength. But when we think about faith, oftentimes we think about it in two realms. We think about it here and here. That is, 
what I rationally believe, that is, whatever I intellectually have discerned in, within my mind, I act upon that, and that is faith. And I will tell you, that's part of it, but that's not enough. It's not enough to just know who God is and believe that God is God and believe that Jesus is Jesus and then act in accordance to that. God wants more than that. He doesn't just want it to be all about the intellect. He also wants the heart. And, and when we really think about this, what drives us in life is the heart. And Jesus said it this way, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What is treasure? Do you have any treasure? You may think, well, I don't have any treasure. You know, everybody in here has treasure. Now, we may not have a, a chest somewhere with a lock on it that we open up and there's all these shiny, you know, valuables in it. But, but the word treasure just means whatever you esteem as valuable. That's what it means. What's valuable to you? And whatever you decide in within your heart, within your mind, what is the most valuable thing, that has your heart. And what does that mean? It means it has my affections. It has my passions, it has my desires, and hopefully we'll be able to illustrate this, that, that this morning as we go through this. But I want to set a tone there that Jesus connected the heart with what we believe is valuable. Whatever you treasure, that has your heart. The heart is not independent of the mind, and the heart is not independent of the strength. Here's the easiest way I know how to illustrate that. You ever seen somebody that, that love cars? And maybe they get an old car, and I like muscle cars. I, like, I, I just think they're, they're the best cars that were ever made, in my opinion. That's my opinion. You may disagree. But, but they're very coveted by people. They'll buy a muscle car, and they'll restore that car. And you know what happens? You pick the one that you look at and you esteem as the one that you really think is the most valuable. Or maybe it looks the best. Or maybe you like the motor in it or, or, or whatever. And, and you know, as you start to work on that car, you know what happens? It becomes more than a car. It becomes something that has your affections. And, then, and so, you know, you'll go to bed at night and you'll sit there and you'll think about it. You'll think about it while you're trying to go to sleep. You'll wake up thinking about it. And while you're at work, you think about, oh, I wish I could go work on the car. You, you understand that, don't you? That, that when you start to develop affections for something, it, it sort of dominates the horizon of your mind and your thinking. And then you know what happens when something has your heart and your mind? You start devoting your energy to it. And so whatever has your heart, it's going to dictate what you think about and what you do. And so if we don't start with the heart, what we get is this. We get people that believe in God and they'll do the bare minimum for God, but not much more than that. But when our passion is for God, we give our life to God. And it's not work to do for God because it's our desire, it's our affection. We love it. And so if we don't start and attack the heart and look at the heart... We can have a lot of people doing a lot of things, but for the wrong reasons. Now, does that matter? Does that matter? Does it matter? As long as we, we do things for God, does it matter why we do it? A man came to Jesus and he said, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so Jesus answers him and says, Well, keep the commandments. And he names some of the commandments. And Jesus responds by uh, or at, the man responds by saying, I've kept all these from my youth. So Jesus names some commandments. And, and then he says, one thing you lack, go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. If you just look at this on the surface, you'll think, well, that's a hard thing that Jesus asked him to do. Why would he ask him to sell everything he owned and give it to the poor and come follow him? And then people ask, well, is that what God wants from me? Well, maybe, but no. That's not what God requires of everybody. But what he, the application of this is what God requires of everybody. And that's the thing. He didn't single this one person out and give him a higher standard than he did the rest of humanity. Whatever the application of what Jesus is telling this man, it applies to me and you. And it's not that we go sell everything that we own and give to the poor, but there's something deeper here than just Jesus saying, sell your possessions. It's much deeper than that. The Bible says he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. Now listen, for he had great 
possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And they were confused by that. And so it says the disciples were astonished at his words, at this saying right here. How hard is it for a rich person to enter into the kingdom? They were astonished at that. And so Jesus clarifies their confusion. He says, children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? You know why it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God? Because how, how do people usually get rich? By seeking it. And this man had sought it and he had, had, had obtained it in his life and he loved it. That's the problem. He loved it. He left sad because when he looked at follow Jesus or keep my riches, he said, I want my riches. I don't want, I don't want to follow Jesus if it means i got to give up my riches. He trusted in his riches you know what? We're even warned about this in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor trust in uncertain riches, but in living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. You know what Paul didn't say? Timothy, you go out and you tell everybody that's rich that they need to sell everything they own and give it to the poor. He didn't say that, but here's what he did say. You tell them not to be high-minded, haughty, to be arrogant, or think they're better than other people because they're rich. And you also tell them don't trust in those riches. But use them. Use those riches. Use what God has blessed you with. Use what you have maybe obtained through the hard work and pursuit of, of getting these things. And you share those with other people. Don't just be rich in possessing. Be rich in good works. Be ready to give. Willing to share. Storing up for yourselves a good foundation for the time to come. That you may lay hold on eternal life. So what's the difference in being rich... And what we saw with the young rich ruler and this type of being rich, where a person is using those riches and God is pleased with him, it all comes back to one thing. What do we think is the most valuable thing? And a person who esteems their riches as the most valuable thing will not share those with others. They won't use those things. They may do it for tax purposes. <laughs> they may do it for glory. You know, we've got a whole, we've got a pandemic on our hands. And I'll tell you what that pandemic is. It's, it's that everybody is carrying around one of these. And so we always have instant access to a video camera. And so we've got all these people on YouTube. And, I, you know, one of those that I think about is Mr. Beast. And maybe some of you kids know who Mr. Beast is. He's just extremely wealthy. And he goes out and he helps a lot of people. He, he uses his money to help people, but not without a film crew. Not without a film crew. And someone says, well, who cares if he's filming that? I mean, those people are still getting fed. They're still getting clothed. He's still doing good for them. That's right. They're still getting good done for them. But what God has called his people to do is do good things for people, but don't film it. Don't put it on social media. Don't sound a trumpet and say, did y'all all see what I did for this person? No, you do it for the Lord. Why? Because the heart matters. Why you do what you do matters. And if it's done to glorify you, it's for the wrong reason. You do it for God. And so to the rich, he says, use those things to help other people. And why do they do that? Why do that? Because God is number one. He's the most valuable. But you know what? It's even deeper than that. Paul says this in Colossians 3 and 5, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You know what, that's hard for me. When I think of idolatry, I think about what was going on back in the time in Egypt and, and all these other nations where they were making carved images. And you know, God talks about that, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But when I think about idolatry, I think about an image that someone falls down before in worship. But Paul said covetousness is idolatry. Now, we often associate covetousness with money, right? And probably rightly so, because that's a, a big temptation, is to covet money. But covetousness just means a greedy desire for more. It could just be about contentment. It could just be about not being satisfied and always craving for more and more and more. And why would he call it idolatry, though? That's bizarre. How can covetousness, which is sort of an abstract thing, be a false god... You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or, what, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. What, what was the problem that God had with carved images? We got a lot of carved images, don't we? We see carved images everywhere. You go through Hobby Lobby, there's a lot of carved images. Is, is God looked down at Hobby Lobby and is he angry at Hobby Lobby because of the carved What What was the problem with carved images? It wasn't that God hated engravings. It's that God is jealous. You know, people have a problem with that. They read that and they say, God is jealous. That's weird. God is not jealous in the realm of, we often hear jealous and we think envious. God's not saying I'm envious of you. He's saying I'm jealous over you. And there's a big difference in those two things. Envy is when I look at someone else and I want what they have. Jealousy is when something belongs to me and I'm jealous over that thing because I don't want anyone else to have it. That's who God is. God is jealous over you. He's jealous over your heart. He's jealous over your service. And it starts with this. You will have no other gods before me. I don't want you to have other gods. I want to be your God. I want to be the only God. And I'm a jealous God. And I'm not going to tolerate you having other gods. Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 3 was, as Ezekiel was prophesying against the nations of Judah and Israel, he says, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put them, put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? It kind of hits home when you think of it that way. It's not that they carved an image and they set it on a pedestal in their house. That was wrong. But he said they have an image, they have a God that they've set on a pedestal in their heart. And God said, they've done that. And he said, should I even listen to their prayers? Should I even give them any attention when they've done that? He's a jealous God. And you know, we probably, probably none of us, I don't think anybody here has ever set up an image and, and, and got down on the ground and fell down at their feet or, or sang, sang praises to some carved image. I, don't, I, I would just be really surprised if anyone in here ever did that. But you ever thought about this? Have we ever set up an idol in our heart? You say, I don't think so. <laughs> what is an idol? He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy, you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You know, we talk about this scripture a lot because it emphasizes that people can be play acting. They can be putting on the front, we might say. That is, putting an outward show on for everybody to observe, but on the inside it may not be right. But, but I want to really think about this, these three words right here. Heart is far. The heart is far. It it wasn't just that they didn't notice God, that they didn't believe in God. He said, there's a big distance between me and these people's hearts. And they're saying words that are words of honor. Their, Their lips are saying the right things. Maybe their hands are even doing the right things. He talks about that in other places. But he said, they're whited sepulchers that on the inside are full of dead men's bones. God looks on the inside of a man. He's not just concerned with what our hands do. He's concerned about that, but he's not just concerned with what our hands do and what our mouth speaks, but what's going on on the inside. And God wants our heart to be close to him. And when our heart is far from God and it's close to a lot of other things, we run into some problems. And I'll tell you, one of the ways that we can judge or we can discern in our own life if perhaps our heart is far from God, or maybe we've got idols in our heart, or we don't love God with our whole heart, one of the things that we see is here in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 9. He says, For this is a rebellious people, false sons. That's a strong word. False sons. You know what he means by that? They are pretending to be the children of God. Sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, that is those that could see the future, who say to the seers, you must not see visions, and to the prophets, you must not prophesy the truth to us, speak to us pleasant words, 
prophesy delusions. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Stop speaking before us about the Holy One of Israel. Who was this? It was God's people. God's people, and and I don't think they necessarily verbalized it this way, but God was looking at their hearts, and He knew what their hearts were, and He said the desire of the people is to say to the people, I've sent to them to tell them the truth. Don't tell us the truth. Don't tell us the truth. Just just keep telling us what we want to hear. Just make us feel good. And you know, the King James, I believe it's the King James, uses the phrase smooth words. Speak to us smooth words. You ever had a meat smoothie? Sounds gross, right? A meat smoothie? I mean, if, I, if, you, if you cooked me a ribeye steak and threw it in a blender and put liquid in there and ground it up, I, and I don't want that. Do you want that? I think sometimes we want the meat smoothie. Oh yeah, tell me the truth. Just make it a lot easier to swallow. Make it real easy to digest. Because I don't want to chew on it. You know what we should do if the truth is tough? If it's full of gristle, keep chewing. Just keep chewing. It's hard to swallow. Keep chewing. Why? Because if our heart is really desiring God above all things, when somebody tells us the truth, even when that truth hurts, we're going to be thankful. You know why? Because we love the instruction of the Lord. Because He's the most valuable thing in our life. It's so important. It's more important than any other thing that I'm right with God. They looked at the prophets and they said, Don't you tell us the truth. You quit telling us who God is. You quit telling us about God. Don't tell us about the Holy One of Israel anymore. It's a warning sign. If we like the meat smoothie, if we want to hear things that make us feel good all the time, and we're resistant to the hard things that God's Word said that would make our hearts actually be closer to Him, it's a warning sign that we're not loving God with our whole heart. And maybe we've got some things in that heart that are combating against God. So what do you care about the most? What do you care about the most? And, and, and if I said, what is the right answer? I, I have no doubt everyone would say, God, God is the right answer. What should you care about the most? God, Jesus Christ, that's what I should care about the most. You know what, that's what Jesus said. In Matthew 13, 45, he said this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. He said the kingdom of God is the most important thing and it's so important that if somebody was going out and they were looking for goodly pearls, when they saw the kingdom, they'd take every other pearl that they'd ever found and they would sell it to buy that one. Because it's, it's worth more than anything they ever labored or told for. So it's obvious, right? What does it mean to value the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus also said it this way. He said, if your hand offends you, do what with it? Tuck it in your shirt? No. <laughs> Pretend it's not there? He said, cut it off. That's pretty radical, isn't it? That's extreme. Could you imagine today if I pulled my pocket knife out, just started sawing on my wrist? Some of you got nervous, didn't you? We think that's crazy. Rightly so. What if I said, you know what? That ham was going to send me to hell. And some of you would say, I don't care, you're still crazy. But what if that was true? What if the only way that I could be close to God and right with God is to cut that hand off? Is it worth it? Yeah. But that's usually not the problem for us. It's not an appendage. It's not something we need. It's something we want or desire that has taken an occupied space in our heart that we're unwilling to cut off that is causing us to be far from God. Jesus said, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. I'm, I'm sure we know this passage very well. What is Jesus telling us here? He's saying that a good man out of the good treasure. What is, what is he talking about here? Well, don't get this confused with what we read earlier about where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Okay? Different, same words, but different concept, different application. That was about what you value. He's now saying whatever's stored in your heart, the abundance of the things you've stored in your heart, that's treasure here. Whatever your heart's full of. Does what? It determines the outcome. 
And so the content and quality of our life and our person is dependent upon whatever we've stored in our heart. And he said the abundance of the heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, this is true negatively and positively. You know, if somebody is cussing all the time, you know why? Because there's something corrupt in their heart. That's why. People that lie, something's corrupt in their heart. That's why they're lying. It's not just because their mouth just takes over and says things that they're not in control of. They have esteemed something in their heart that's causing them to have that corruption there, and they're lying. We could go on and on and on, but it's also the same of, of what we value. You ever notice that about people? When I was in high school, I'll tell you what the most important thing in life was to me. It was basketball. And I don't even know why I, I had this huge, thick almanac, NBA almanac, that I would sit at home and read. And there's no reason in the world I should be able to tell you that, on, that what happened on March 2nd, 1962. I shouldn't be able to tell you that in relation to basketball. But that's the day Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points. That's a very important moment in basketball history. I shouldn't, I, I don't know all your birthdays, but I know that Michael Jordan's birthday is February 17th, 1963. He turned 60 years old this year. Why do I know that? I shouldn't know that, but I do, right? And so if you want to talk basketball, that's fine. We can talk basketball. We can talk basketball all day. And you know what I'll do the whole time? Smile. I love it. I don't watch NBA that much anymore. It's not really, a, but that's how I was in high school. You know, another thing in life that I notice is there's a lot of loyalty to the Dallas Cowboys. You either love them or you hate them. There's really not a whole lot of middle ground there. But you know, if you're a true fan of the Cowboys, if you're a true fan, you'll know the roster. And a lot of these people know the roster. They know where they went to college. They knew when they were recruited and how they were recruited. And they know what position they played. And if you talk to people that are true fans of the Cowboys, you know what they'll tell you? They'll tell you why the Cowboys didn't do good last year and which positions they need to clean up and, and, and who they need to exchange. And maybe this person needs to not be on the bench. They need to be on the starting line. And we need to get this guy a quarterback. And there's all these opinions and passions that are related to the Dallas Cowboys. Why? Because of our passion and our desire for them. So we talk about it. The abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You talk to people about movies and TV shows. And man... They know about all the characters and their backstories and, and then all the struggles that they've been through. But then talk to them about characters of the Bible. Who's that? We don't know those people. We start thinking about the roster and subbing people. Why are we so worried about subbing in on a team that we have really no investment or interest in, but not worried about who's the players in this room and how we're going to win for Jesus Christ and what we can do to grow and to improve and strategize and do better. What's in our heart? What about this one? There's a lot of God's people that are more worried about what's going on inside this building than what's happening in this building. That that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing that needs to change to make everybody's life better. And I'll tell you what's going to make everybody's life better. The gospel of Jesus Christ will make every individual's life better. And it's not a systematic problem. It's not what it is. It's not a systematic problem. It's an individual problem. It's a heart problem. Our nation's where it is because of the heart problem that's in this country. And it's in the individual. It's not some giant heart that we poke and we change. But you get people started and they'll get passionate about what they saw on Fox News about what somebody said yesterday about this new policy that's coming out. Why are we so concerned with that, but we're not concerned with, the, with what God's policies are, what His precepts are, what's going on in His kingdom? Because so I'm going to tell you, no matter what happens here in America, Jesus is still on the throne. He's still there. He's still in control. What about this one? You say, you're meddling now. I know it. I know I'm meddling. This is an idol for a lot of people. It's all they think about is advancing their career, making sure that they're able to buy and obtain and, and advance. And I, I don't want to minimize the importance of careers because we have to do that. we got to work and we got to provide. God calls men to be providers for their family and we need to be providers. But you know what? Sometimes it's more than a job. It's more than a career. It moves God out of our heart and it replaces him. Music is the same way. 
I'll tell you, it's probably the closest thing to the idol worship that we saw in Israel today is a concert. I know because I've been to it, I've been on the stage, and I've been in the crowd. It's worship. And I'll tell you, if you're on that stage and you're playing, you know what it is because you experience it. Why? For what? I'll tell you another pandemic we've got is this one right here. And someone's thinking, well, I'm glad he didn't put PlayStation up there. Video games. Video games. It's all people think about. It's all they want to do. Sit in a chair and play video games with some person they think they've got a relationship with over in some foreign country because they fight up with them against the enemy. It's not real. And if you're careful, it's all you'll think about. It's all you'll do. How do I know that? Because I've been there. I've been there. And I'll tell you about distractions. We've got them with us all the time. You know, that's what's different about life today. That's what's different. It's used to, you'd have to really seek out your hobbies, seek out your interests to really think about it. But I'm telling you, my phone, I don't know how many notifications this thing sends me every day, reminding me of anything that I've searched for. If I search something about golf, I'm going to have like 50 of these things on my to remind me of the distraction, to remind me of that thing that really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And we carry them around all day. You know what studies have shown? They've done real neurological studies where they hook people up to equipment and they take their phone and after they reach a certain level, they have to go plug it in across the room. And when they plug the phone in across the room, people will sit there and look over there over and over again. And it actually triggers the same neurological responses that separation anxiety does when you take a kid and remove them from their mother. Isn't that crazy? Why? Because it occupied a place in our heart. Are you maybe thinking, man, you're telling us everything's wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying let's not be the young rich ruler and look at service to God and think, I'm not going to cut that off. I'm not going to change anything about that. That's what I want to do. And you're just going to have to deal with it, God. You're just going to have to deal with it. Do y'all remember when we used to travel in a convoy to go to gospel meetings? We'd get 30 or 40 people together. Why don't we do that anymore? I'm suspicious. We're all distracted. We're very busy people, aren't we? We're very busy. You know, some of the best times we had were just taking a convoy, going to a restaurant and eating, and going and listening to someone preach the gospel and seeing our brethren in other towns. Just going and supporting them. Y'all remember when we used to have Bible studies in homes all the time? And now what are we doing? We're chasing our tail to find time just to do anything. Isn't that ironic? We get all this technology and convenience, and the whole purpose of it is to make things faster. We can get everywhere faster than we ever could get. We can communicate with people faster than we can ever communicate. We can accomplish things faster than we ever could accomplish. And yet we have less time now than we ever did when it took a lot longer to do those things. You know what we'll do? I just am too busy. We used to have singings in each other's homes, get-togethers in each other's homes. For no re- it wasn't even in relation to a gospel meeting we're having. Just people say, hey, we're going to get together in our home. We're gonna... You know what we did? We built relationships. And it's, it was strengthening. But we got real busy. Luke chapter 14, Jesus said to them, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I, go, I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. You know those three excuses that those people made? They were very important things. They, they involved possession of property, a piece of property, does God expect us to be good stewards, stewards with the thing that we own? And, and that, Yeah, absolutely. That was important. What about the oxen? Was that important? Yeah, that was important. What about a wife? You tell me a wife's not important? Well, you can't have mine. 
and we'd suffer without her. What's his point? The point is we will make excuses to not do what God has asked us to do. We'll make excuses why God can't be in our heart completely. But wouldn't it be interesting if instead of God's people saying, well, God, I can't do that because I've already committed to do this worldly thing, we start telling the world, I'm sorry, I really care about what's going on there, but I can't do that. I've already made a commitment to God because He is in my heart. You know, this is another familiar verse for us right here, and we often focus on all this right here, and that's really important. Be ready to give a defense of the reason why we have hope in Jesus Christ. But you ever thought about this top phrase? What does that mean, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts? I thought God sanctified us. We can't sanctify Him. Don't, don't misunderstand what this word means. It, it doesn't mean he has, we set Him apart as holy like He does with us. What it's saying is to put God in His proper place in your hearts. Set him apart from everything else in your hearts. He's talking to people whose life was hard, who were being persecuted, and the only way you're going to get through this is to make sure God is here. Because this is what God wants. God does not want a corner bedroom in your home. He wants to fill the house. He doesn't want a bunch of roommates that he has to navigate around. He wants the house. God doesn't want to be an appetizer. He wants... The whole meal. He doesn't want the leftovers of our time and our energy and our passion. He wants the main course. That's what he wants. And he deserves it. Because of what he did. He deserves it. I, have, I, I, I would just assume that some people think, you, you sound like a radical, Ian. You sound like an extremist. Listen to what Paul says. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul said, when you look at what Jesus did, the mercies of God, and then you give your entire life as a sacrifice, your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole strength, everything you've got, you give that all to God. That's not extreme. It's reasonable. You know what that word means? Reasonable. It's the word logikos, which is where we get our word logical. You owe it to him, is what he's saying. That's not extreme, it's not radical, it's just logical. That we would give our life to God because he's given us what? Eternity. He's given us eternity. You know, the heart's a deceitful thing. It's deceitful. Mine is. Is yours? your heart ever lie to you you know we have all these little pithy sayings that we say well the heart wants what the heart wants but we never say well should the heart want that thing (laughs) or people say hey just hey i don't know i don't know the answer just follow your heart but then the heart is deceitful above all things why would you follow something if you knew it was a liar Now, the heart's not always a liar. The heart's not always deceitful when it's filled with God. The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But God says, I can. I know the heart. I search the heart. I test the mind. You know what? I can put on any display for everybody in here to watch. I can show you my life with my actions, but you'll never know what's in here, but God does. And God doesn't have to look out here. He wants to see that, but he doesn't have to look out there because he looks right here. And we can fix everything out here and not fix this. And I'll tell you what we're doing. We're lying to ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. And they're thinking, I fixed the problem because I fixed this. No, this has got to be fixed. And so just for a few moments as we close, I want to talk about that. How can we make sure we fill our heart with God? You know why David is called the man after God's own heart? It's not because he made all the right decisions. He made some really bad decisions. And it, actually, if you go through First and Second Samuel, you're not really going to get a, a, a loud picture that David was always the man after God's own heart. But then you look at the Psalms and you understand it. You get it. Because what was going on out here wasn't always a reflection of what was in here. 
And David said, I have sought you with my whole heart. That's what it really means to love God with all of our heart. It's not just about loving God with our heart. It's about loving God with all of our heart. My whole heart, he said, I've sought you. I've, I've sought after. Well, what does that mean, I've sought you? What happens when you seek after something? You know, we went out to Aaron and Annie's one night, and he had this little par three course set up out there for us to mess around on. And there was some really tall, thick grass out there. And we had a lot of fun, but there was some balls we walked around and we just went. And he's like, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> well, well, they're just shag balls. We'll find more, right? I mean, that's kind of how you are about seeking things. If, you, if you're looking for something, eventually, if it's not that important, you'll just give up. I remember in East Texas one day, my wallet went missing and I was fixing to leave town. And I, I mean, my blood pressure was rising. I was, we never were, were like stressed out about trying to find shag golf balls. But I was stressed out trying to find my wallet. We looked everywhere, everywhere. And I mean, by the end of that, I was breathing heavy, and I, I was just like, I don't know what to do. And I thought, maybe I should go check the trash can. So I checked the trash can. There was my wallet. Why is it in the trash can? Because Olivia was like five years old. <laughs> she found my wallet. It's trash. <laughs> it wasn't to me. I mean, when you really want something, you really see its value, it will stress you out not to find it. And so you seek it, and you seek it with your whole heart, every passion, every energy, every breath, until you find it and you grasp it. And that's what David said I did. He said, Lord, I've sought you with everything. And because of that, don't let me stray. I put your word in here. I've sought you and I put your word in here so I don't do what is wrong in your sight. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast or a right spirit within me. That's what we need. If we're not loving God with the heart, we need to cleanse it out. And you're not going to do that until you start asking Him to do that every day. You've got to seek it. You've got to seek it. I'll tell you, this one's hard. This is a great song, by the way, an old song that we have in our book. It comes from this psalm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. That's a scary thought. To just look at God and say, look at it. Just look at all of it. Look in my heart. Test it. What's the point? Because I don't always see my heart. I don't always know what's wrong. I don't always know what's corrupt. So God, test it. Tell me what's wrong. So we can address it. You know what God wants? A broken heart. We do everything in the world to avoid our hearts being broken. Sometimes our heart needs to be broken. It needs to be broken. I, I found this the other day and I just thought this was so interesting. James chapter 5. This sounds like Isaiah or Jeremiah. It's James that says this to God's people. He says, you lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. That's a pretty vivid picture. What do you do to an animal right before you kill them? You get them real fat. You get them real fat. You know what he's saying? You're good for nothing but killing. Why? Because you've fattened your hearts. By doing what? By doing what feels good. By never denying yourself. By living in comfort and convenience and luxury, he said, you're just fattening your heart. See, God wants a broken heart, a clean heart, a pure heart. You know what we do? We fatten our heart. I want to read one last passage with you this morning from Joel chapter 2. Again, Joel is prophesying against God's people. And he says, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. 
Now, we don't have time to get into this, and I wish we really did. Fasting. If I were to ask for a show of hands today, how many of you fast, spiritually fast, I don't mean intermittent fast, but spiritually fast for your faith? How many hands would go up? Do we fast? You say, well, that's old. That's Old Testament. And fasting is not even a New Testament concept. And again, we don't have time to look into this, but it's absolutely a New Testament concept. God's people in the New Testament fasted. And why did they fast? What was the purpose of fasting? Do you think God is saying, hey, I want you to fabricate some tears for me? Mm -mm. That's not what he's asking them to do. You ever fasted? You know what fasting is often called in the Old Testament? An affliction of the soul. Isn't that interesting? We, we live in luxury and comfort. We fatten up our hearts. You know what fasting does? It starves the heart a little bit. Starves it a little bit from all the distractions. Because when you fast, your body constantly reminds you, hey, you need to eat. Hey, you're hungry. Hey, this is painful. Hey, you don't feel right. you got a headache. Hey, you're feeling kind of weak. You know what you do every time you remember that when you've made a decision to fast? You tell your body, no, no, I'm doing this for the Lord. And I'm going to tell you after a couple days, it'll break you a little bit right here. It'll break you a little bit. Because that whole time you're fasting, you're spending that time in prayer. And every time your body says you're weak, you're hungry, you're hurting, you pray. And I'll tell you, it'll change your prayer life. Because you'll start out with something that seems very familiar and after about a day and a half, you're going to be in unfamiliar territory. And all of a sudden that heart that God says, rend your heart and not your garments, it's ripped wide open and the tears flow. It's not something that's fabricated, that's fake. Why did he say don't rend your garments? Because <laughs> that was the outward show. Those people, when they were distressed and mourning over their sin, you know what they do? They'd rip their clothing, and God said, stop that. Quit that. Rend this. Tear this open. And turn to me and starve yourself of the luxuries for a moment. Focus on me intently with your heart. Turn to me with your whole heart. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pour out my mercy on you. Friends, it's hard. It's a, it's a high calling that Jesus gave us to love God with our whole heart. But I'll tell you, if we're going to, if we're really going to, we've got to notice our distractions and put them in their proper place and put God in His. Put Him where He belongs. And that's at the throne of our heart. At the throne. And when we do that, everything falls into place. We worry, if, we, if I do that, what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. God's going to bless you richly, more than you could ever imagine. Maybe your heart's broken today. Maybe you need Jesus Christ for any reason, for forgiveness, for whatever reason. If you need Jesus today, we're going to sing a song, and the words of that song are, Break My Heart. And sometimes it does. Our heart breaks, and it draws us toward God, and that's needful at times. And if your heart's broken this morning... We're not trying to put that on display. We just want to say if it's broken, come to the healer, come to Jesus, and let him mend it and heal it. So if you have a need this morning, come have a seat on the front as we stand and we sing together.